coming up on Double Tap TV. We tackle web accessibility Norway style. Why it's illegal to have an inaccessible website in Norway and not in the rest of the world. The latest tech. I'm Alexa. I can answer your questions. Interviews. There will be several dozen shows trickling in over the months. Accessibility. We're, we're actually running a pilot scheme with the CNIB at the moment. This is Double Tap TV. Welcome to Double Tap TV. I am Mark Aflalo with Stephen Scott. Thank you guys for being here. We want you to get involved this week. Email us, feedback at ami.ca. And of course, on Twitter, it is at Double Tap Canada with the hashtag Ask Double Tap. Stephen, you screen a lot of the emails and a lot of the feedback that we get. We thank our, our, our viewers and our listeners so much for getting involved because we're going to talk to them later on in this week's show because a very, very interesting topic at hand. Yeah, absolutely. Web accessibility back on the agenda once again. And really interesting this week because we're going to find out how one particular country has managed to make it illegal to have inaccessible websites. I mean, that sounds crazy when you think about it, doesn't it? It sounds a little nuts. And when you brought this story to me, Stephen, you know, I, I felt like I was kind of blissfully unaware of what's going on in the world. And you kind of broke it down to me. But can you, can you break it down for our viewers out there? Yeah, Mark, I can. Put simply, it is illegal for a website to be inaccessible in Norway. The country's Anti-Discrimination and Accessibility Act of 2008 is their first disability-specific nationwide non-discrimination act. There are similar acts in place in countries around the world. In Canada, for example, disabled people are covered by the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, as well as the Canadian Human Rights Act. These acts offer protection to disabled people so they cannot be discriminated against because of their disability, whether it be while trying to receive services or find employment. One area that still remains a challenge, though, is web accessibility. How do you encourage the public and private sector to ensure their websites and apps are able to be used by everyone? Stuart Seaborn is a director of litigation for the Disability Rights Advocates Organization. In our experience dealing with, with companies and covered entities both before litigation and after the fact, those who've had persons with disabilities, whether it's vision impairments or other, other disabilities, in positions of leadership, in decision making uh, positions, often have a better understanding. The conversation is much more smooth uh, in terms of what the fix is, uh, how to monitor it, etc. Um, whether to build in accessibility at the design stage, how to keep uh, programs in place like with web design or app design so that as webs and app, uh, the web uh, functions and app functions are updated, um, there's the flexibility to build an uh, accessibility instead of having to create new solutions from scratch every time. When we've had uh, companies and covered entities that have people with disabilities in those decision-making positions, the conversation flows much better we can actually kind of step out of the room, let our constituents uh, speak directly to those involved. Uh, you kind of you take the lawyers out of the picture, things work much more, more smoothly. Um, when, when they don't, when it's more of a, can I check the box for compliance, it becomes a much more difficult conversation. The negotiations take longer and we often end up in litigation. So how does a country like Norway make it illegal to have an inaccessible website? Well, they introduced rules that meant private companies would be fined if their websites were classed as inaccessible. The law is enforced by the state agency DIFI, the Agency for Public Management and E-Government, which assesses websites of major companies randomly. The report is then published on the DIFI website and the company gets hit with a deadline. But what if they don't comply? In 2017, major Norwegian airline SAS launched a redesigned website. In November of that year, the verdict from DIFI came. SAS failed on so many criteria that DIFI said it was impossible to use. If SAS didn't comply and fix the issues, they would be fined. Each company is given a year to comply, but when it didn't, SES were given an additional week and threatened with a €15,000 fine every day thereafter. That equates to around $22,000 a day Canadian. After no movement and lots of complaining about how hard it would be to remedy the issues and no action whatsoever, that threat of the huge daily fine clearly got them thinking and in 12 days' time, the website would be fixed to everyone's satisfaction. Companies such as Apple, Google and Microsoft are doing their bit to ensure that content created online is accessible. Hector Minto from Microsoft says it's the right thing to do. 
Accessibility is one of those mega trends. You know, it's not going away. It's just going to keep growing. Uh, we're building a future digital society, and if we don't proactively include people with disabilities, we're just going to bank problems for the future. So, you know, it's really important that we're having this discussion across the whole industry. You know, Stephen, aren't we already causing a ripple in the community because of this? Is this not going to have an effect on other countries and other communities throughout yeah, the world? Yeah, and a lot of it comes through legislation, Mark. So you've got the Act, like I mentioned, the Parliament-driven, Government-driven Act, which is really important. And like I say, you've got all these companies doing great work as well, but it's, it's the individual website designer, it's the local store, the, even the larger stores, they've got to make their products accessible. And sometimes you need law to make that happen. Clearly, that stick approach is, uh, is working well in Norway. I think similar could work really well around the world. In the only other country in Europe that's doing this at the moment is Spain. And uh, it's interesting to see them doing it as well, but not countries like Canada or the US or the UK. Uh, interesting, those countries haven't yet followed suit and they really need to. Yeah, they absolutely do. Well, you had the opportunity to sit down with a woman who was actually instrumental in designing the law in Norway, and that was at TechShare Pro. So we're going to take a quick break. I'm going to remind you again, it's feedback at ami.ca if you want to get involved. We're going to be talking to or reading emails later on in this week's show. On Twitter, it is at DoubleTapCanada with the hashtag AskDoubleTap. We take that break and come back here on DoubleTap TV, and Stephen had an opportunity to sit down with Mylon Rick. Love Double Tap TV? Listen to AMI-audio for Double Tap Canada every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern for news and reviews on everything tech. This is Double Tap TV. This is Double Tap TV. Thank you guys for being here. I am Marco Flalo, and Stephen Scott is standing by with the guest for this week's show on the topic, of course, website accessibility and why in Norway it's illegal for your website to be inaccessible. Before we get to that, I want to remind you that if you want to get involved, we're going to be getting to your questions later on in this week's show. So email us, feedback at ami.ca. On Twitter, it is at Double Tap Canada, and use that hashtag, AskDoubleTap. So when Stephen was at TechShare Pro, he had the rare opportunity to sit down with one of the women who had a hand in actually crafting the law in Norway that makes it illegal for your website to be inaccessible. Hi, I'm Malin Rik. Uh, I head the Norwegian Authority for the Universal Design of ICT. It is great to have you here on the program. Thank you so much for joining me. I was really keen to get you on the show because we talk a lot about accessibility. In our previous episodes, we've talked a lot about the importance of web accessibility, how the web can be made more accessible. In Norway, though, you have a real story to tell, a real triumph story, and that is the importance of encouraging companies to, um, to make their websites accessible, to make products accessible, all of that, uh, by using the carrot and the stick approach. Mm. Tell us what Norway has done. Well, Norway tried, I think, with the carrots for a long time uh, to make well digital services, or in this case, apps and websites, uh, and also self-serving machines, actually, mm. um, accessible. Uh, but as in 2008, uh, kind of realized that we have to do something more. So it took some years, but by 2013, we had a new regulation in place, which uh, requires all websites and apps uh, to follow certain guidelines to uh, be what we call universally designed. Um, and uh, the authority was established at the same time. Uh, and we have been then overseeing this and follow up the regulation since 2013 by both mainly guidance, uh, we do a lot of guidance work, but then of course also with uh, inspections. So we inspect um, up to 20 businesses per year, uh, and uh, we, we issue reports which we publish, which is very important, uh, and then the businesses get a time frame to correct their mistakes. And if they do not meet the time frame, at the end, we have sanctions uh, in the form of daily fines that we can issue uh, to make sure that the, whatever outstanding errors there are um, is being corrected. So you've gone a considerable way forward in encouraging, mm. that's one way to put it, encouraging businesses yes. to, to make their, uh, their, their websites or uh, apps more accessible. Mm. Um, I think it's really interesting when you talk about the daily fines, mm. you talk about the regular inspections as well. This is mm. not just a case of, well, we've enforced the rules, 
it's over to you now. And then the, the expectation is then on the business to keep that going. Mm. We all know, for example, of apps that have been accessible mm. and then an update has, has killed the accessibility in it. Mm. Uh, and, and that can be a real challenge, can't it? So mm. it's about that regular inspection. How successful has it been? this new regulation? I think in many ways this is early days and because it's a new regulation in a new area. Uh, but we did a survey in 2014 just like to check the status uh, and then we the overall result uh, was about 51% which uh, is very different. It differs a lot from business to business and within sector to sector. Uh, but now we did a new survey in 2018 and uh, the overall result is about 60%. So it has moved forward. What does that number mean when you say 51% to 60? What are we talking about here? We're talking about uh, how many of the tests that are compliant. Right. It's not like 50% of the businesses are mm. compliant fully. We found actually almost all of them had some errors. Uh, but um, the number of errors have gone down. You know, that's, so that's good news. like overall. That's good news. So it's moving forward. And in some uh, sectors, for instance, the banking sector uh, went from being one of the, uh, the sectors with the poorer score to being one of the sectors with the higher score. So that was a very positive development in one particular sector that has solutions that are very important for people in their everyday life, paying your bills and doing a kind of payments. Uh, so that was very encouraging. And then, of course, there are sectors that are not so moving so for, uh, fast forward mm. and that we see differences. Yeah. I think what's really interesting is that you've made such a proactive step here mm. to make companies think. Mm. Do you think that businesses are starting to realise the value of disabled customers, or perhaps before they never, prior to this regulation? Again, I think the answer is a bit both. Mm. Some businesses have really taken this in, on board and are doing a lot of good things. We have uh, a web store uh, called Stormberg who has done a lot uh, and just like traced also that if they do things on accessibility, their mobile sale go or sale via mobile platform goes up because you know it benefits more customer groups than you might have thought of in the beginning. And then others are not so much uh, or doing it more of you know because they have to maybe uh, but but our overall impression is that once you get people over the threshold of this is difficult this is expensive to do and get them over to what do they actually have to do they start to get traction on you know oh this is actually something that can benefit us as a as a business and uh, at least be profitable because you you reach larger user groups and as mentioned before today you know you you make it more optimal for google to find your content for instance and you do it and make it more accessible on mobile phone normally if you do some of the things on your websites and yeah it's it's slowly starting to get the message, or well, we're getting the message through, true, I think. I guess for you, success looks like businesses taking this on mm. a little bit like what you're saying, you know, that businesses are now coming up with solutions mm. to the challenge and, and helping other businesses to succeed here. Um, so I guess that's what success perhaps maybe looks like. Do you also think that it's important that those businesses uh, start to talk about the work mm. they've done with accessibility? Mm. To encouraging others, so the, you know the, the yeah. word of mouth approach almost. The ultimate success will be when the users are not meeting the barriers that they are facing today, and of course, there the progress will be slower. I think because this will not happen overnight. Because you know, as we know, accessibility work on web pages, for instance, is both you know with the code and the design and the development, but also with all the content that you produce every day, and so you have to work with. Business is not only like buying the right uh, stuff or doing the right thing when they develop, but they also have to make routines and make changes in the way they publish their content and, you know, all this daily work. And it takes time to change, you know, the whole business culture in every business before really seeing the big results for the users, I think. And talking of the users, have you had feedback from people? Do do disabled Norwegians feel more empowered 
as a result of this, th th this, this regulation, this, this law essentially is behind them? I hope so, uh, because uh, it is a statement from society saying this is important, this is what we as a society want to expect from the digital arena uh, or the digital services that are provided. Um, but I think they still meet a lot of like practical obstacle in their daily life uh, still uh, and find that okay we are 14 people in the authority and we have 200,000 businesses to oversee so mm. it takes time and they might think that some of the efforts are too small or not coming soon enough uh, which I totally understand. Uh, the, for us, six years is not so long as a newly established authority that have to develop everything from methods and all the things that we've done. Um, but for the user that is still waiting to just like pay their ticket or do their, it's six years is a long time. So I totally understand that perspective. That is Stephen Scott in conversation with Mylan Rigg. When we come back, we're going to get to your questions, so email us feedback at ami.ca, and on Twitter, it is at DoubleTapCanada with the hashtag AskDoubleTap. This is DoubleTap TV. Love DoubleTap TV? Listen to AMI-audio for DoubleTap Canada every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern for news and reviews on everything tech. This is DoubleTap TV. We are back on Double Tap TV. Thank you guys for being here this week. We are talking web accessibility, Norway style. He is Stephen Scott. I am Mark Aflalo. We're going to get to your emails in a couple seconds. It's feedback at ami.ca and on Twitter at Double Tap Canada with the hashtag Ask Double Tap. Stephen, the opportunity to sit down with someone like Mylon Rigg, who really had a hand in designing this law, is a really cool, unique opportunity. And it really you know, strikes a chord with me because I've done some website design in the past and I'm on the smaller end of the spectrum. I can only imagine the pressure that would be on my shoulders if I was designing a website, knowing fines like that are in my future if I don't get my act together. It definitely works, does it not? It does, and it seems to be working well in Norway, which is fantastic. We want to see this expand across the world. I mean, do we like the idea of huge fines being delivered to companies? Um, I think when it makes when it, when it makes the company realize that their product is not available to disabled people and disabled people aren't happy about that, uh, you know, and they therefore won't buy your product, that alone should be enough of a reason to change your position. But clearly that's not happening. So we need this stick approach and uh, Norway are doing that, which is absolutely fantastic, I think. Um, but it's interesting, Mark, because you know you've, like you're, you're saying, you know you've developed websites. I don't know how many times you've thought about accessibility and, and universal design, as is often what we call that type of design, accessible websites. You know, essentially they can be used by everybody. And there's an interesting article which I know you're going to pick up some points from from Ida Allen from a, a Norwegian blog website. And uh, it really does highlight and bring home how universal design can, of course, help disabled people. And that's obviously what the main purpose is, but it actually can help everyone. You know, absolutely. And it goes along with this email that I have in my hand right here from Paul, who writes us in Regina, Saskatchewan. He goes, I know you guys talk about web accessibility a lot, so this will obviously ring true and be a natural for you guys. Are there tools out there or resources that I can use to learn what it takes to build an accessible website and more so, are there any organizations or companies that I can go to to check my site afterwards to make sure it's accessible? And I think this kind of goes into that article quite nicely, who gives some pointers on things that you can do. And you know, when I I'll throw the uh, throw the website up on the screen here, it says, you know, being able to navigate a site with a keyboard is great for my mom who has Parkinson's, but also great for my brother when he has tendinitis. So this is more than just people with visual impairment. These are disabilities of all kinds, which is why it's so important to really take on this universal design approach, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that's the point. So, you know, we can all be temporarily disabled. We've all used our phone with one hand at some point, probably today. Uh, in that sense, we are impaired with uh, motor de dexterity. And I move on in the article. Uh, if you caption videos, that's great news for hearing impaired, but also great when I'm on the train and I don't have my headphones. Of course, I mean, like, I mean, anybody reads captioned videos or captions articles all the time. So being able to do that you know, it, it makes any website accessible for people with hearing loss or people who just can't have the volume yeah, up. Yeah, that's the benefit of universal design. It works for, the, like you say, the guy with hearing loss and the person sitting on the train who just wants to watch a video going by. It works across the board. Good readability, that's another one for the visually impaired, but also something that 
she's grateful for when she forgets reading glasses at home. That's a good one. Yep. Uh, good semantic HTML, which is great for screen readers, but also for search engine optimization. I mean, these are great tips that people can use, and we'll post this on our Twitter, and we'll we'll post this online so you guys can read it yourselves. But with tools like this, and if you you know, there there's a website for Universal Design, right? What what is it? It's the the organization. Oh yes, yeah. so w... you've, you've, there's an organization, a kind of a set of rules essentially that a lot of developers follow. It is a there's a lot of detail to it, but it is essentially the way we have our websites designed uh, universally, and it's called the WCAG guidelines. If you uh, search for that online, WCAG, it's constantly under review. It's something that has always been looked at. In fact, there's a review of it going on as we speak. Uh, results due out later this year. But that is the standards that are set by uh, web developers, or should be set by web developers, so that they can make their websites accessible to everyone. Now, Stephen, you designed the DoubleTap.online website, for example. Yeah. And I know that you used WordPress because WordPress has a lot of the, you know, the back-end coding and stuff really taken care. Were there any challenges that you found when picking a theme or designing that site that, as a blind person, trying to design a website made it even easier or, or more difficult for you? Yeah, well, I did the thing where I bought a theme for the website. So instead of actually creating my own theme, which you can do, uh, but that involves coding and CSS and stuff I just don't really know much about, uh, I bought yeah. a theme. And what I did was I looked for any themes that were labeled accessibility ready. And what that means is the developer has spent time making sure that it's an accessible website. And often it will say conforms to WCAG 2.0 standards, right? So if you've got that uh, in your theme, uh, you can contact the developer. You can ask them for a free trial of the theme to make sure that it is going to work for you, make sure it looks good as well. The thing for me, Mark, is that you know accessibility should not mean that it's an ugly website. It should look good. You know, only four percent of the people in the world who are actually blind can see nothing at all. So that's a huge number of people. Ninety-six percent of people who have some kind of vision in some form or another. And it's very important not to be scared, you know. Don't be scared about reaching out to developers. What's the worst case? They don't respond to you, you know. They're not responsive. Yeah. So that's fine. But the other thing is, and we've talked about this before, is that when you're navigating websites, if you land on something that's inaccessible, reach out to the company. They may not even be aware that their website's not accessible. It might be a, a developer somewhere in their department that did something that might have broken something. Don't be afraid to call things out like that because you're not you're not hurting anybody by doing it. The only thing you could possibly be doing at the end of the day is helping a lot of people who weren't even aware and therefore consuming that website inaccessibly. I'll be honest, Mark, blind people don't tend to be very quiet. You can't be a shrinking violet when you're blind. I always say that. <laughs> uh, and I think that's important because you, know, you have to speak up because who else is going to speak up on your behalf, right? Share, name, talk about the issues because then we can all you know, get together and, and combat this. We've got to get rid of this idea that a website has, in order for it to be accessible, has to be ugly. Because that's the first stumbling block for so many developers. They're not interested if they think the website's going to be impacted in terms of how it looks. And the truth is, there are some beautiful websites out there that can be fully accessible and are fully accessible. I think what we need at the moment is a place where people can go and view what accessibility looks like and actually get a bit more of an understanding as to what it means to be accessible. Uh, maybe that resource just isn't there yet. Yeah, maybe that's something we should look into actually talking about a bit more in the future. Um, and you guys, if you don't want to speak up, you know, maybe we can do that for you. So uh, shoot us an email to feedback at ami.ca. Find us on Twitter. It's at Double Tap Canada. And use that hashtag, Ask Double Tap. Uh, we're more than happy to scream and shout on your behalf. Stephen, thank you, obviously, for being here. Uh, on behalf of yourself, I am Marco Flalo. Thank you guys for being here as well. And uh, we'll see you on the next edition of Double Tap TV. For more great Double Tap TV content, visit ami.ca slash Double Tap. Hosted by Marco Flalo and Stephen Scott. Editing Marco Flalo and Will Latar. Integrated Describe Video Specialist Ron Rickford. Coordinating Producer Jennifer Johnson. Director Production Kara Nye. Director Programming Brian Perdue. VP Programming and Production John Melville. President and CEO David Arrington. Copyright 2020 Accessible Media Inc.